We're about to go into the word this morning, spend some time looking into the scriptures. I would invite you to open in your Bibles to Genesis uh, chapter 42. We're covering a, a large portion of scripture this morning. Genesis chapter 42 through 44 is uh, the passage of scripture that we're looking at this morning. Actually, not 44, 45. Excuse me, 42 to 45. That is four chapters this morning. And just because that wasn't enough, I also put Revelation chapter 7 up there too. So uh, we're going from Genesis to Revelation this morning. Can I get an amen this, in this place? All right. And uh, so if you want to open uh, also in your Bible in the end, the book of Revelation chapter 7, uh, that is where we're going to end up today, um, Lord willing. Join me in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, what a gift it is to us and to our hearts. Lord, it is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. It shows us how to live. It shows us the way in which we should go. But more important than that, it shows us who you are. Father, I thank you that you have revealed yourself to us in the pages of scripture, that you have revealed yourself to us in the person of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that as we spend time in your word today, that we wouldn't miss the point, but that we would see Jesus, that we would draw closer to him. Father, we thank you that you are not a, a, a God who hides himself, but you have revealed yourself to us today. What a great privilege it is to spend time with you in your word and to spend time with your people today. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Today we are finishing the Joseph story. We've spent some weeks now looking at this young man named Joseph. Joseph the dreamer. Remember Joseph? He had some crazy dreams. He had, remember Joseph had those dreams that his brothers were going to come and bow down before him. Now, Joseph's life, um, he had a storied life and a storied past. And Joseph's sort of crazy life, it was crazy before he even got there. Remember, because his brother, or his dad, rather, had four wives. And for those of you who are keeping track, that's three wives too many, okay? Four wives Jacob had, and from these four wives came 13 kids, but Jacob had a favorite wife, and from the favorite wife, Rebecca, came two children, Joseph and Benjamin. And Jacob was a father that played favorites. He wasn't afraid to let everybody know that his favorite kid was Joseph, and his second favorite kid was Jacob. Now, how would you like it if you went on Christmas morning to open up the Christmas presents, and, you know, there was... Coal in all of your stockings, and then your brother just had an Xbox, a new bicycle, a Ferrari, right? I mean, just everything. And all you got was coal. This was the daily life of Jacob's family, constantly putting Joseph first. Well, Joseph has these dreams that his 10 older brothers are going to bow down before him, and his older brothers say, That's it, we've had it with Joseph, we've had it with the dreamer. They come up with this plan to kill him. Instead of killing their brother, they decide to do the more honorable thing by selling him into slavery. So Joseph goes from being the favored son to being a common slave, hauled off into the land of Egypt, foreign land, foreign people, foreign language, foreign gods. And there Joseph finds himself a common slave. Through his, his service and in doing the right thing, he, be, he gets accused of doing the wrong thing. Joseph's master's wife accuses him of attempting to rape her. Of course, Joseph didn't do that. He, he tried to, to you know, thwart all of her advances. Nevertheless, Joseph, for doing the right thing, gets thrown into prison and spends the better part of the next decade of his life, his 20s, as a slave in prison. That's like about as low as you can go, ladies and gentlemen. And here Joseph has a decision to make. Either I'm going to harden my heart against God, my brothers, and everybody else that has done me wrong, or I'm going to choose to walk in forgiveness. And last week we saw that Joseph, he was a man who walked in forgiveness. Why? Because he trusted in God. He trusted that even though others had harmed him and wronged him, 
that God had a plan and God had a purpose. And even though I'm sure there were times where Joseph was in that prison and thought, I don't know how in the world these dreams are going to come true, God, that you gave me. Nevertheless, I am choosing to trust in you today. You can never go wrong trusting in God. And what ended up happening through a series of events that we saw last week, Joseph was taken from the pit, from the prison, and elevated to a position of power and authority in Pharaoh's house. He became the second in command in the nation of Egypt, the most powerful nation on the earth. uh, Joseph was the number two guy. Pharaoh was the only one who was in charge of him. And God used Joseph in a providential way to store up food for a time and a season where there was going to be famine. And so Joseph had put a plan in place. He had stockpiled all of this food and provisions And then the food ran, started to run out. And so there was all of these storehouses that Joseph had stored up. And today we're going to see the conclusion of Joseph's life as his brothers come searching for food. Guess who they have to go and ask for food? Joseph. This is what I'm calling an awkward family reunion. Have you ever had one of those? Maybe you had one of those over Thanksgiving. You thought you had a jacked up family. Let me tell you what. This is a jacked up family. They haven't seen Joseph for 20 years. And here they're going to come face to face with the man that they sold into slavery. Their brother 20 years prior. So verse uh, verse 1 of chapter 42. It says, when Jacob, that's Joseph's father, learned that there was grain for sale in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why are you sitting around looking at one another? Go up to Egypt and get some food that we may live and not die. Uh, How serious is this situation? Option one, go to Egypt and get food. Option two, stay here and die. Okay, serious situation. There hasn't been food in the pantry for a long time, right? They've eaten, they've gone through the, the, the can at the back of the pantry of um, black eyed peas, right? And, you know, 17 year old lima beans, you know, right? They've, they've gone through everything. They've gone through the, the supply of military MRE Y2K stuff that they had purchased, right? Or you know, the guy that's on TBN selling doomsday, you know, rations or whatever that stuff is, right? They've gone through all of that. There's nothing left. It's go to Egypt, find food or we stay here and die. That is a serious situation. I have never even been close to being in a situation like that. And I would bet that probably the great majority of us in here have not faced a situation as dire as that they're facing. But here they are. We have to go and find food. So he sends them off. Verse four tells us, but Jacob did not send Benjamin. So you 10 older brothers, I'm willing to sacrifice your lives on this journey. But Benjamin, he's staying here with me because the last time I sent a brother out with you guys, it didn't go so well for him. So I'm, I'm keeping Benjamin home with me. So it says, verse six, now Joseph was governor over the land and he was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. I don't have the scriptures on uh, the PowerPoint this morning because I'm going to be jumping all over the place. So open with me in your Bibles if you have them. I'm sorry. It's going to be, I can't read every single verse of all four of these chapters. So just the projectionist is doing his job. I didn't put the scriptures on the screen. Some of you are looking like, where's the scriptures? I want them on the screen. Bring your Bible to church. Okay. You know what? I bring my Bible every Sunday, so it's not that hard. It can be done. Uh, Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he treated them like strangers and spoke roughly to them or harshly to them. Where do you come from? He said. They said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. Now, some of you say, well, how could, he not, how could they not recognize their brother? Remember, it's been 20 years. 
How many of you look a little bit different than you did at 17? How many of you have been to your, you know, 20 year high school reunion and they're like, who are you? Just to prove it to you, I found a picture of me 20 years ago. I want to show it to you. Well, I look a little bit different. Let's put that picture up on the screen. I think I brought a picture. It should be, there we go. So we look a little bit different than we did at 17 years of age. Amen. We can get rid of that now. We can go back to the, there we go. Right, so Joseph's been through a lot. He's grown up. He's grown into being a man. He, he's, I'm sure he's dressed like an Egyptian, right? So he's probably got his head shaved and, you know, wearing Egyptian makeup. We also learned that he's speaking through an interpreter. So he's not speaking the Hebrew language to these people, but he's uh, speaking through an interpreter. He's speaking Egyptian to them. So they don't recognize him, but it tells us, verse 9, that Joseph remembered the dreams that he had dreamed of them. He sees them bowing down and he remembers the dream. There might be dreams that God's given you that you have even forgotten. But if they're from God, you know who hasn't forgotten? God hasn't forgotten. And if they're a dream from God, you know what? God's going to bring it to pass. God's going to bring it to pass in your life. I believe that with all my heart. If it's a dream from the Lord, God's going to accomplish it. We got to put it in his, his hands. Joseph, we know, has surrendered his life to the Lord. He's put his dreams in God's hands. God, if it was from you, you're the one that's going to have to make this happen. God here brings this dream to pass. Joseph says to them, you are spies and have come to see the barrenness of the land of Egypt. They said to him, no, my Lord, your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. We're honest men. Yeah, right. They're honest men. We're upstanding citizens. We're a, we're a family. We're a big loving family back home. Your servants have, not, have never been spies. Here's what Joseph is going to do. This is really important that you understand this. Joseph, we know, has forgiven his brothers. If he hadn't, he could just have them killed right here. No big deal. Snap his fingers off with their heads. He has the power to do that. We know that Joseph has forgiven his brothers. But what Joseph does not know is if his brothers can be trusted. You see, sometimes in life, people, I don't know if you've noticed, sin against us. Lie to us, cheat us, abuse us. Some of us have been through incredible hurts, hardships, and pain that have come into our lives by others who have sinned against us. And the Bible says that we should walk in forgiveness to them. Amen? Amen. And so that's us saying, God, I forgive them. I'm choosing to forgive them today. I'm, I'm, Lord, that, that's in the past. You're the one that's going to have to have vengeance upon them. I'm not going to try to make them pay for that. Lord, I'm giving it to you. Forgiveness. We are commanded to forgive. You know what we are not commanded to do? To trust those people again. Amen. See, there's a big difference in forgiveness and reconciliation. Amen. And what happens a lot of times when people have sinned against us, they say, you have to forgive me and you have to trust me again. And we should say, you know what? I have forgiven you, but I, oh, this trust thing, this reconciliation thing, the jury's still out. Amen. Because before I will trust you, I am going to test you and to see if you've changed. Because if the person who sinned against you has not changed, you should not trust them again. Amen. The person who abused you, cheated on you, lied against you, sold you out. If they have not changed, you should not trust them. Amen. 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 So there is a big difference in forgiveness and trust and reconciliation. Yeah. These things have to be earned. Forgiveness we give away freely. Why? Because we've received it freely. Amen. But the trust. There are people in your life that you should never trust again. Amen. 
unless you see visible fruit that they have changed. Otherwise, you, you know what you're doing? You're opening yourself up again to, to receive the same hurts. And for those of us who are parents, we, we need to be careful with our children that we don't expose our children to the forces in our family that hurt us. Amen? So if I've been wounded by, you know, a family member, if I don't see visible change in them, I shouldn't expose my children to them. Hello? It's wisdom. And they say, well, uh, you, you're a Christian, so you have to trust me. No, I don't. I have to forgive you. I don't have to trust you. I don't have to drop my kids off to have you babysit them. Until I see some visible fruit. And let me submit that the level of the, the fruit of change should match the level of offense. Amen. Amen. All right. I've got four chapters to do this morning, so I better get moving. Before Joseph will trust his brothers, he first must test his brothers. So he puts them through a series of tests, three or four tests. The first one is, is this test of seeing whether or not Benjamin is even alive anymore. Because he knows what they did to him. Did they do the same thing to his blood brother, Benjamin? So what he does is he throws them into jail for three days. He says, let's see how you guys like being in jail. Remember, they still don't know that this is their brother. So after three days in prison for being accused of being spies, he brings them out and he says, listen, I don't believe you. I think you're spies. And unless you produce for me this brother Benjamin that you've told me about, this great family that you're a part of, I want to see Benjamin. And if I don't see Benjamin, you're never getting any more food again. So he sends them off back home with food, but he says, one of you has to stay behind with me in my custody. And so Simeon, one of the older brothers, stays behind. They send the brothers off with the food, and Joseph, what he did was he instructed his servants to put the money back in the bags with the food. This is the second test. See, before they had sold Joseph for money, he wants to see if they've changed with the way they handle money. So he takes the money that they brought and they put it back in their sack. Now, when they left each other, in verse 18, it says that as they realized this, they said to one another, in truth, verse 21, in truth, we are guilty concerning our brother and that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen. That's why all of this distress has come upon us. They recognized that the sin that they committed, they think it's coming back on him, on them. They say, remember when we heard Joseph crying and screaming, please don't kill me, please don't kill me, please don't sell me into slavery, I'm your brother! They're saying, remember the way he cried out to us and the way we ignored him, it's come back on us. Today we are reaping for that sin. They've carried this burden of what they did to their brother for 20 years. When they get home, And they see the the money in their sacks. They're freaked out. Because now it looks like they stole the grain and they stole the money back. It says when they saw the money in their sacks, verse 28, their hearts failed them. And they were trembling to one another saying, what is this that God has done to us? Now they start to see that God's hand is in all of this. God is doing something here. What is he doing And so they come back and they tell Jacob, their father, they say, look, this guy in Egypt, man, he gave us a hard time. He thought we were spies. He put us in jail for three days. He said, if we don't bring Benjamin back there, that we're never getting any more food. And he kept Simeon behind in his custody. We have to take Jacob back to go and rescue Simeon. Or we have to take Benjamin back to go and rescue our brother Simeon. And Jacob says, yeah, right. We'll just sit here and eat this grain. Simeon, he can just stay in Egypt for all I care. This faith that you, I'm telling you, this family's got issues, okay? No way. He says, I've already lost Joseph. Now I've lost Simeon. I'm not sending a third son, my favorite son, back to this guy in Egypt. 
So it says that a long time passes, they go through all the grain, they go through all the food, they're back in the same situation. And Jacob comes to his sons again and he says, hey guys, uh, why don't you run down to Egypt and get us a little bit more food? You know, like why don't you run down to the Taco Bell and go through the drive through and go pick us up some whatever that stuff is they sell at Taco Bell. <laughs> and so... Judah speaks up and he says, Dad, you remember this guy, this very powerful man. He said, unless we come back with Benjamin, we're never getting any more food and we're going to be put on trial for being spies. Now, up until this point, Judah, who speaks up in this moment, has he been a very impressive character? No, absolutely not. Right? Judah's the one that came up with the bright idea to sell Joseph into slavery. Judah is the one who raised three ungodly, wicked, evil sons two of which were so evil that God just had to kill them. You know, you think your kids are pretty bad. Well, God hasn't just flat out killed them yet, you know. Like, this, these, God, these men were so wicked that Judah raised. That God just said, that's it. Only death and destruction are in their path. It's better for everybody if they're gone. God takes them. So Judah lies to his daughter-in-law says, one day I'll, I'll give you to my third son to be his wife. He doesn't. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. And so she, his daughter-in-law, dresses up like a prostitute. Judah gets her pregnant, his daughter-in-law pregnant. This is Judah. Not a very impressive guy to this point. He speaks up. And he says, listen. Unless we take Benjamin, he's not going to give us any more food. We'll never come back. He said, send the boy with me. And we will arise and go that we may live and not die. Both we and you and our little ones. He's saying, listen, if we stay here, if Benjamin stays here, he's going to die anyway. Because there is no more food. He says, I will be a pledge of his safety. From my hand, you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. Judah, in this moment, we see that he has had a transformation along this period of 20 years. He's a different man. This is not the same Judah that sold his brother into slavery. This is not the same Judah that raised these wicked, ungodly sons. This Judah is now saying, I will be responsible for his life. I will take care of him. Let me bear the responsibility. And honestly, folks, this is the difference between a child and an adult. This is the difference between a man and a boy. A boy says, I don't want to be responsible. A man says, I, I will bear the responsibility. I welcome it. I will take it upon my shoulders and I will guarantee his safety. Judah has grown up in the last 20 years. Jacob blesses his sons. He says, verse 14, may God Almighty grant you mercy before the man. And so as they come in now before them, they come in before Joseph. They still don't recognize them, but Joseph sees Benjamin. When he sees his brother Benjamin, his heart breaks and he begins to weep. He has to run out uh, of the room to compose himself. And he puts on a great feast for his brothers. He puts on this feast of, of just feeding them and celebrating and having a wonderful time. And he gives Benjamin all this double portion of food from his own table. That night it says that they drunk so much that they got intoxicated and that Joseph had this special, like, cup or mug or, I don't know, something. It was made out of silver. So something about this cup that Joseph was drinking out of was very distinct. And so the next day, he, he sends them all off, Simeon with them, released from custody. Had been in custody for about a year, probably. They all go away. He, he sends them uh, with the money. They actually brought back double money to prove that was the second test, remember? They brought back double money and said, look, we don't know what happened the first time, but here this time, we're bringing you back all the money. We didn't steal it. We're honest guys. 
They pass the second test. So the third test, they say, put my cup in Benjamin's sack, my silver cup. And so they put his cup in Benjamin's sack, Benjamin's sack of grain. And so a few miles get down the road and he sends his servants after them. This is the third test. And the the servant comes and says, we've blessed you so much. We've been so good to you. Why are you stealing from us? Why did you steal this cup from us? They said, we didn't steal anything from you. They said this, this was words hastily spoken. He said, we didn't steal steal the silver cup from the Lord's house. Verse nine, whichever of your servants is found with it shall die. And we also will be my Lord's servants. If you find the cup in anybody's sack, you can kill that person and we'll be your slaves. We know we didn't steal this cup. So it says they put their sacks on the ground and they started with the oldest and went all the way to the youngest. And it says, verse 12, the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. 13, then they tore their clothes and they were greatly distressed in their heart. They said to themselves, they started having this argument, God has found out the guilt of what we did and it's coming back on our heads. They're blaming each other for what they did. So they come in now before Joseph. And this is the final test. This is the final test. Judah speaks up again. In verse 33 of chapter 45, Judah says this. He says, please let your servant, please let me stay instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord and let the boy go back with his brothers. Here Judah who once sold his brother into slavery, now says, I will stay in his place. I will take his place. Let him go. I'll stay as a servant. The brothers passed the test. They passed the test. Upon seeing this selfless act of self-sacrifice, Joseph can no longer compose his emotions. He, he breaks down and he begins to weep in front of them. This, this strong person, this powerful man is broken like a child and begins to weep. And the brothers are looking at each other like, what is going on? He sends everybody out, all of his servants, everybody out of here. I just want to be with these guys. And at this point, I'd be like, oh, MG, we are roadkill. This is not going to end well. But Joseph says, come here, come here, come here, come here. Come close to me. He says, I'm your brother. I'm your brother Joseph that you sold into slavery. And at that point, I would have soiled my pants because (laughs) this is the second most powerful man in the world And it is the guy we sold into slavery. We are toast. This is it. We're dead. We're all dead. He says, come here. Come here. It says that they were dismayed. That's the Bible's way of saying um, everything else that I just said. They were dismayed at his presence. Verse 4. So Joseph said, come to me, please. And they came near. Can just see him. No, you go. No, you go. You go. You go. I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. Listen to this. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither planting nor harvest. He's saying, You think the last two years have been bad? You ain't need to see nothing yet. There is five more years of famine coming. Verse seven, and God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on the earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. 
He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord over all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry up, go tell my father and say to him, your son Joseph is alive, he's in Egypt and we want you to come. Joseph sends his brothers and he says, go get dad, go get your wives, go get your kids. Come on, I'm gonna take care of you. I'm gonna provide for you. I'm gonna set you up in the penthouse You guys are going to be rolling on 22-inch rims, Escalades, you know, DVD players on your seat. I mean, it's just, it's incredible. The, The transformation that they've gone from having nothing in a moment to having everything. And you see, this was God's plan all along. Jacob, when he learns that Joseph is alive, he, he freezes up. When his brothers tell him that, that Joseph is alive, they somehow leave out the part where they threw him in the pit, sold him into slavery, and brought back the animal, you know, stained, blood-stained coat of many colors. They somehow leave that part out. They just say, Joseph's alive, and he's a, um, second in command in Egypt. It's amazing. You, you've got to come. So uh, J- Jacob just, he, he can't believe it. He, he's frozen. It's like his heart froze within him. He, he's like no expression, just. And so finally he, they, he begins to believe them when he sees the entourage that Joseph sent to bring them all back. And he says, that's it. I'm going to go see my son. I'm going to go see my son. And what we've seen through all of Genesis, and we're getting to the end of Genesis at this point, one theme over and over and over again is that man has sinned, but that God redeems. Man sins, but God is the redeemer. And sometimes we've seen God bring redemption through his invisible hand, his sovereign hand of providence. Here we see God bring, bringing redemption and restoration through someone who walks with him. You see, God can bring redemption through his sovereign hand of providence, but God can also bring redemption and reconciliation through you. If you will walk in his ways, if you will trust in him, God can use you to bring reconciliation into your family that you think is so jacked up. God can use you. But it starts with humility. It starts with forgiveness. It starts with walking with the Lord. You know, we're all heading into Christmas. We're heading into the holidays. There, you might have some awkward family reunions in front of you. Let me encourage you to walk in forgiveness and to encourage others as well to walk in forgiveness. When your brother or your sister or your aunt and your uncle wants to pretend to be the archaeologist and go dig up the past from 40 years ago and bring it down to Christmas dinner, say, let me tell you how I've forgiven them and encourage you to do the same and see if God can bring healing to your family. I know that he can. Three times Joseph tells his brothers, God sent me here. God sent me here. You didn't send me to Egypt, but God sent me to Egypt. We've seen that Joseph had a hard life. Living in the will of God and the plan of God, it's not an easy life. Joseph has had a hard life. He's had a difficult life. And just because you maybe have had a hard life, have suffered harm, have suffered setback after setback, have been abused, have faced a trial. Just because all of those things have happened to you, it does not mean that God has forgotten you. Joseph's brothers forgotten him, but God had not forgotten him. Just because all of those things happen, it does not mean that God is not with you. Just as God was with Joseph, God is also with you. God has not abandoned you. And if you're in the middle of that season, all it means is that you're not to the end of the story yet. That God is still writing out your redemption story. That at the end of your story, there is a moment of redemption, just like it was for Joseph. Revelation chapter 7 talks about this great moment of redemption. 
after a season of great tribulation is what this is talking about. Revelation chapter 7 verse 14. John who has this vision is speaking to an angel. He sees all of these people clothed in white garments. He asks the angel, he says, who are all these people? This great multitude of multitude of people. Who are they? The angel says, they are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. Now this is speaking of a a larger story, and I'm not going to get into all the tribulation stuff, but at a smaller scale, how many of you have had some tribulation in your life? Amen. (laughs) You've gone through some tribulation. He says, these are those who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white. In the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God. And serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb is in the midst of the throne. And he will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eye. Joseph was on a throne, and he provided for his brothers. He offered them forgiveness and reconciliation, and he provided for them an incredible salvation. There is a greater king who's on a greater throne. His name is Jesus. And there's coming a day where he will wipe every tear from our eyes, where every wrong that we have suffered, he will make right, where we will never again for all of eternity suffer lack or want or hurt or abuse. This day is coming. This day is the end of our story. Those who remain faithful, those who have had their Garments washed clean in the blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ. You know, when we look at the world and we see the news, there's never any good news on the news. You notice that? It's always bad news. I hardly watch the news anymore just because I don't want to be depressed. Every day, every day, murder evil, wickedness, people losing children, losing health, losing loss, 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 pain, suffering, violence, inequality, racism, hatred. It's just constant. And then even in our own country, this divide, this political divide between those on the left and those on the right. And how do you even know who's anybody? I mean, what, what are we divided about? It's just, it's just chaos. And when we look at the world, we could be tempted as we see not light shining bright, but darkness growing and growing and growing. We could be tempted to lose hope. And I guarantee you there were many times where Joseph sat in that prison and he was tempted to lose hope. But he chose instead to put his faith in God. Because God had put a dream in his heart of the future. And just like the dream God had given Joseph, God too has given us a vision of the future. And the question is whether or not we will hold on to the dream. We will hold on to the vision. We will hold on to the promised good future that God has given us. And if we do, we will see it. We will see it. And there is coming a day when Jesus Christ will split the sky wide open. And he will return. And he will establish his kingdom. And every knee will bow before him. It's not just going to be ten brothers bowing before this king. It's going to be, the, it's going to be everyone at the name of Jesus who's going to bow the knee. Every, praise the Lord. And so until Jesus returns, 
We must keep our eyes fixed and focused on him. The story of Joseph, what it tells us, believer, Christian, those who have been washed in the blood, this story, it tells us, take heart, take courage. We serve a sovereign God. We serve a God who can use evil, even, can use even the evil deeds of wicked men to accomplish a great plan of salvation. And so as we see the evil, as we see the injustice, as we see the pain and the hurt and the suffering as Christians, we take heart and we say, God, you're going to work this. God, you're going to redeem this. God, you're going to take this and you're going to make it right. That's the vision of the future that you've given me. And so I'm going to keep my eyes focused on Jesus. Amen.